Hello. How are we all doing? Good? Yeah. Nice one. So in the last month or so, I've had um, two huge experiences which has happened, happened to me. Um, both completely different. Um, one that didn't really involve me at all, and then one that, that did a lot. Um, and they interrelate, so I want to kind of start off by talking about the first one and then kind of move to the second one later on. So about three weeks ago, um, I got a phone call from a TV presenter, and um, I, was, I was chuffed, uh, basically like, hey Nick, we really want to, we want to come and interview you, we want to tell your story to the, to the nation, we want to know about your business, you guys have been doing some interesting things lately, you've, um, you've had some success overseas, we, we want to know about it. And I was kind of like, cool bro, <laughs> I'd, I'd love to have a chat, that'd be, that'd be great. So um, we met up a few days later, and um, I, thought it, I thought it went really well, so it was like an, about an hour and a half of hanging out, the first half an hour was literally just sitting down. Um, talking about coffee, talking about what we do, our approach to it, um, where we started and kind of where we are and, and where we're going. Um, and a big part of that conversation revolved around um, a particular coffee that we launched earlier in the year. Um, it was extremely rare, we only had 12 kilos of it, um, which is very, very small, and we were retailing it for about $12 a cup, um, which is like, someone whistle? If I could whistle, I would whistle. It was, it's insane, it's a lot of money for a cup of coffee. Um, and then to kind of even, I guess, make matters more dramatic, we were selling it as an espresso. So a 30 mil double shot was, was $12. <laughs> and um, we're like, you know, this, this is great. The whole idea was, was mainly a marketing and edu educational idea. Um, and we, we sold out within the first five days, which was cool. We then even went one step further to tell all of our customers, hey, if you guys don't think this is worth 12 bucks, I'm not going to charge you. And I think out of the 400 cups that we sold, one person said that. And that was because they don't usually drink espresso, so you know. <laughs> but I, to be honest, I can, I can firmly say hands down, it is one of the most delicious things I've ever put in my mouth. Um, and the reason, why <laughs> the, reason, the reason why it was so expensive is it's insanely rare and it's super high quality. Um, now, after talking to this report of half an hour, we then went through and talked through the roasting process and basically what makes the beans go from green to brown. And then from that, we went up to the, the bar. Um, I made a, a bunch of different coffees. Um, we then tasted them together and I talked about flavour notes that they could be tasting and why they'd be tasting those notes. Um, some of them, they were like, yep, no, I can taste this. And others, they're like, you're crazy, man. And I was like, fair enough. Um, so yeah, all in all, I thought it went pretty well. And a few days later, it came on TV. Um, I was up in Auckland at the time, so I kind of sprinted home from my last meeting to the hotel to, to kind of see this. As in a way, it's you know, like the Kiwi dream. Four years ago, you start something with nothing and no idea what you're doing, and four years later, you've got a little bit of something, a bit of an idea of what you're doing, and you're about to be on TV. Mum's proud, and Dad's a bit sceptic, but <laughs> <laughs> you're all with it. And um, it started off really well. They had some great shots at the cafe, great shots of the coffee being poured. Um, and then the first kind of sentence they put up with me was talking about this expensive coffee. And as soon as I'd finished that line of dialogue, the sound effect came on in the background, which was cha-ching. And I was just like... <laughs> <laughs> and um, a few, few clips later, they had another, another clip of me speaking, and um, same deal, concluded with cha-ching, cha-ching. And I was just like, oh, no, where's this going? And basically, um, towards the end of the, the article, and I guess the, the ending quote, was, was, pretty, much, was pretty much this. This, this is a quote from what they said. Um, aside from instead of using the word wanker, they said a word that rhymes with banker. So, bit of an interesting experience. I was up in Auckland all by myself, um, just being called a wanker to the nation. <laughs> Had a bit of um, an odd to what to do. Um, but the weirdest thing was, I wasn't gutted or sad at all. It actually struck me in a, a way where maybe, maybe this is something to do with our approach and how we're kind of selling our coffee, marketing our coffee, and, and talking about what we do. And, um, and this is something I've been chatting with the guys lately, and we've actually, without knowing until a couple of years ago, structured a whole business around this. Um, and it's, there's two main points. There's, there's quality and there's education. Basically, quality has always been and will always be the number one goal. And then the way to get there, or the vehicle, is, is education. And um, so that's, I mean, it, was, it was a pretty eye-opening experience. It was, more, almost, I guess, one of those light bulb moments. So what I wanted to do today was basically use this as a... I guess a guinea pig, <laughs> to talk about two things. Um, one big question and then one kind of minor question. Um, the first is, what is specialty coffee? And then the second is, am I a wanker? Um, <laughs> now, um, in, our, in our business, we're very, very involved with social media and, and with our customers, and we relish feedback, you know, like, absolutely. But with one of these questions, just remember, I am a human being, I do have feelings, and um, be gentle. Um, 
So basically, what is specialty coffee? This is, this is a question I get asked probably every second day by a bunch of different people, and I still don't have a proper answer for it. Um, mainly because the specialty coffee world and the coffee world beyond that is just so huge. Um, and the reason why I've chosen this photo to put up there is because I feel it represents this. So this is um, my business partner's hands over in Colombia. His name's Matt, and his wife, Kai, has taken the photo. Um, they're probably going to go on and become hand models after this. And um, basically what it is is a coffee cherry with two beans inside. And the reason why I love this photo is it speaks to so many different directions. Um, the first thing I thought of when I saw this was, well, wow, can you just believe that the coffee industry, which is one of the largest legal traded commodities in the world, is just a bloody cherry. <laughs> and um, it got me thinking, like, how many, how many, um, how many cherries on a cup of coffee? And I was like, well, on average, we have 21 grams in an espresso shot of, of ground coffee. From that, you've got about 150 beans, and then 160 beans, sorry, which equal up to about 60 cherries. So 60 cherries go into a single cup of coffee, which is pretty huge. Um, and then if you're going to look at it on a bit of a bigger scale, like what would, what would average cafe do in a day? Some of our cafes do around 400 cups. So about 32,000 cherries go into 400 cups of coffee, which is just, it's bizarre. It still freaks me out. I've known this for three years, and I'm just like, oh my goodness. Um, but specialty coffee is, and I guess this is a way we explain it to most of our people we do tasting classes with and um, barista training classes with, is essentially a higher quality coffee. Um, so if you're familiar with craft beer, or your more kind of boutique ones, it's right out there with them. It's the, the top tier. And how we decide on what quality is, and I guess what makes a coffee special, or speciality, is all done through a tasting process called cupping. Now, a lot of people know cupping is a different method. This is, this is particularly the coffee. And essentially what you do is you go down a long, a long table, or a circular one, and you're slurping coffee. What, what you do is you have a ground, a ground um, a ground puck, you add, hot, you add hot water to it, and you let it sit for three minutes. Now, the whole idea behind this is to basically get an even extraction of just the beans. Now, this cupping process, this is done throughout the world on pretty much every single cupping table at every single farm, every single roastery, sometimes cafes, depending on how involved they are. Um, and it's as simple as you let it sit for three minutes, you scrape, and while you're doing this, you're assessing all the aromas, assessing everything about the coffee, and then you slip it. Um, it makes a weird kind of sound. Um, almost like the, the most improper way to eat soup, if you can, if you can imagine something to compare it to. Um, now, while you're cupping, especially if you're scoring, and this, this reflects back to the specialty, um, you have a score sheet which looks something like this. Now, I scored on one of these sheets for the first time a couple of years ago, and the first time I did it was with some of the nicest coffees I've ever tasted with one of the most um, well-respected coffee people I've ever met in my life. So I was just like, Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. And um, it's almost like working your way through a science graph. But when you start to break it down, it's very, very easy. You have your sweetness, your acidity, your bitterness, body, tactile, and all you're doing is scoring and measuring the intensity levels of each one. And that's what builds your score. So essentially, specialty coffee, or all coffee in general, is scored out of a scale of 100. Now, when you start scoring 80 or above, that's your special, that top 20. So that's like your craft beer, your wine. Now, usually to get to this point, you have to have, I guess, a bit more work put in down the start of the value chain. Hence why the cost can be sometimes more. And then, of course, there's the demand as well. Now, when we first started out roasting coffee, we didn't really know what we were doing, to be honest. It was, it was kind of like a, beans are green, now they're brown. Does it taste good? I don't know. Um, I think so. Yeah? Good, good. Um, but now we, we do have a really good idea of where we're at. And the funny thing was, is to a point, we did know what we wanted and what we were on about at the start. And like I mentioned earlier, our two main drivers, quality and education, have always been at the forefront of our mind and always been. And that's the key to this. So this is a really simple mock-up of our specialty coffee chain. Um, and the reason why I've made it so simple is because, in a broader scheme of things, it, it really, really is. Our ideal way of trading coffee is dealing with a farmer, dealing with the roaster, which is ourselves, and then a customer. So whether that be a cafe or you come into one of our shops and we serve you a coffee. And the idea from this is we can actually have an input into every single step along the line. The key to making specialty coffee special starts right back with the farmer. That's, that's the key. Now, this is Helena. This is um, my other huge experience I was talking about. Uh, about 18 months ago, my business partner Matt was traveling through Colombia, um, basically had an opportunity to be there and was like, I've got an opportunity to go to Colombia, I'm going to Colombia. I was like, 
fine, I'll keep working, it's all good. <laughs> and um, about two days in, Tweety updated all the social media stuff, saying, hey, Matt here from Flight, yada, yada. Um, I'm in Colombia, going to be checking out some coffee farmers, learning about the specialty coffee chain and what that involves. Ten minutes later, a lovely lady called Jade, who is now a very good friend of ours, messaged back saying, hey, Matt, I'm one of your regulars from back at your cafe in Wellington. I'm at a farm in Colombia, you should come and hang out. We're like, great, we haven't got any money to, to like, pay for accommodation, so can we stay at your house too? It worked out really, really well. And um, <laughs> the farm is called Helena, um, and it's owned by this, this lovely chap, Mario, in the pink shirt. Um, that's Jade in the front there, caressing a, a new little coffee baby. And um, the two lads in the back are Alejandro and McGill, who are Mario's sons. Um, now, Matt rocked over to these guys, and I was like, hey, how's it going? Thank you so much for having me. Um, to be honest, I just want to... I want to hang in, I want to learn about as much as possible and what you guys do. This is what we do. We've just recently changed our whole business model to go down the specialty route, and, and we're looking for people to partner with. We want to learn and we want to, we want to grow. Um, so it was, it, was, it was a great, it was a great introduction. Basically, Mario kind of walked us through the whole process and what happens in Colombia. And to break it down quickly, most of the farmers there, they'll farm their crop as per usual most of the time throughout the year. They'll then harvest, and then they'll either leave it at the end of the driveway, or they'll drop it down to a mill down the road. And what happens is basically they sell that coffee for a market price. And that market price is, di is dictated by the New York Sea. We have no control of it, they have no control over it. The benefit for them is that they have a guaranteed sale every single harvest. So not so benefit is the price can fluctuate quite dramatically. Now, the harvest just been, the price was quite low. And if they did keep doing it this way, they might not have been in business anymore. Times weren't that tough, but it wasn't a very sustainable future. Um, so due to Matt's recent travels and our, I guess, study and, and work back in New Zealand, we have learned quite a bit about what it takes to farm some pretty amazing coffee. So we said to them, hey, why don't, um, why don't we partner up? Why don't we go for your infrastructure with you and see what we can do to basically improve what you're already doing to bump that quality up? So first we got some coffee from them, we sound for it up, and we, we scored it. We then sent it around to four other roasteries that we know all around the world, and these guys are qualified tasters. They have a certificate, they have a, a certification, which is probably one of the hardest exams we've ever heard about to pass. It's a five-day a five exam, 70% of the people who sit it fail it, so it's kind of a, well, I'm, I'm aiming to sit it later. <laughs> um, and they all came back scoring an average of 74, so about six points under the cuff of 70, especially. We're like, that's right, we can work with this, we can work with this, we've got over six months till the next harvest, let's see what we can do. So basically we started going through all of their infrastructure. Um, and the first thing we started realising was the key thing lacking across all boards was education. And if we want to achieve that quality, education is the way to get there. So we started working with the pickers and the farmers, saying like, okay, cool, what are you guys actually picking? What's, what's your fruit like? And like all fruit, um, I don't know if you guys have been lucky enough to grow up with fruit trees in your backyard, but I've had everything. Mum and Dad have been good. Um, very, very healthy. But if you can imagine picking a plum when it's a bit underripe and then biting into it, it's like a giant acidic bomb, yeah? And then if you're going to go down the other end of the scale when it's getting a bit pre-ripened, it's almost a bit dusty, a bit airy, a little bit of fermenty. The same deal applies with coffee. So this photo here, you can see some really nice red, luscious cherries and then some underripe ones, more green and yellow. And what they were doing is picking all of them. Now, when you do that, you're getting all that, that flavour I was talking about, the underripe, overripe, combining into the ultimate product, and that brings down the score of quality. So hence that 74 would, would, be, would be the reason why. Um, this is another photo of just showing, I guess, the effect of, of what they can have. So the one, the lighter one, um, would be your, your very, very acidic, and then your fast one would be your bit fermented. It would start to taste like almost a bit, bit of rotten fruit would, would be the profile you get in the cup. Now, basically, we, we had a, an educational talk with the, with the pickers and said, hey, look, guys, what we want you to do is go out into the field and pick less. Pick half as much as what you're already picking. And they were freaking out because they're picked on how much they can, they're paid on how much they can pick. Now, they were a bit like, oh, man, who are these guys coming in here trying to change everything? We did the first day. They had a 6% pick rate, which was, which was all right. You know, we were, OK, we can work with this, we can work with this. The next day, boosted up to 80%. And the day after that, boosted up to 94 And that's what they were handing out. And this picture here is from the third day in of just nailing the picking. So this stuff was all prime, prime fruit. Oop. Sorry. Um, so basically from here, we then sent it back to New Zealand, sent it around to the same people who scored it before. And it came back scoring an 84. And we were 
pumped, you know? That's 10 points off about what of last time. That means the market price can go up for it, and it means that we're able to buy it because it's a specialty and we can on-sell it to our customers. So from that, we ended up paying them two and a half times the market price of what they were currently going to get if they left continue what they're doing, which is pretty awesome. Um, and yeah, the, the second big experience was two weeks ago, we just landed the first shipment. So this is us first time out in the storeroom, unloading it off the, the, the container, putting it onto pallets, and it was just like, Man, this is, this is insane. We've been working, Skyping with these guys, emailing these guys for 18 months now, and it's finally so amazing to, to bring it back here. And then the end result, this is, this is the, the Helena coffee, um, right in front of our sample roaster, right next to our big roaster, about to start getting ready for production. And we sent them this photo, and they were just insanely emotional in their response, like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. And the beautiful thing about it is, not only do we just get to add value to our own product at the end of the line, but we actually get to use their brand and market their farm and market their people, and that adds value and motivation all the way back to them. So right now, they're sitting back there going, all right, this is amazing, this is amazing, what are we going to do for next year? What's, what's the plan? How can we do this? They've already started putting an implementation plan to insert new drying beds, which, again, boosts the crudity. Um, more education for the pickers. And it's been, it's been really, really fantastic. Um, and that's, that's basically the, the summary of what's just happened with, with our first green coffee story. We're aiming to work, up, work with a lot more farmers. We've got some, some communications going in Mexico at the moment, um, Ethiopia as well, but it's a bit, bit tricky with the, the um, legislation and the, <laughs> um, the culture there. But we're, we're definitely starting to make some wins and make some tracks, so it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, so, thank you so much for your time. <laughs> <laughs> Wanker. <laughs>